One of you. So before we started really rolling, uh, you threw up a sign. You have you, you. It seems like you you are one of the most industrious people that I've ever met. I saw it on the show. Um, and it really is to, to the point that, you know, a lot of people came from other places or they, they had these very um, normalized lives when they'd go back to you live this. This is a lifestyle for you. This isn't this wasn't you're just playing in the woods. This is you know, this has become or it was it is a lifestyle of yours. Absolutely. Yeah. For a long, long time now. And I think that that's a huge difference that you see between myself and some of the other participants who this is actually like our chosen life mm -hmm. versus this is something that people are enduring until they can get back to their comfortable life and doing it for money rather than because they love the experience. So I think that that really comes through as a strength when you're out in, you know, a grueling wilderness situation and how grueling you experience it depends on how normalized it is. Well, it's funny because I, I love one of your terms from the show was that you were you wanted to sur thrive instead of just survive. Uh, right. And, and I think that's a, a huge thing is that, like you said, there are people who can just grin and bear it and kind of like grind it out. Or there's people like yourself who you had the most extravagant. I was like, this is like the Martha Stewart of the woods. She's knitting herself <laughs> a, a scarf out of a rabbit. You had insulation in your walls. It was um, it was just an incredible thing to see. How did you what Thank got you, you into yeah, ancestral? Absolutely. What yeah, kind of I was all about long term it wasn't like can i get the you know can i get to the win it was like how long do i have before we have to go home <laughs> absolutely and, like, and you like asked how long do i get to be here not long, how long do i have to and it was 73 days mm -hmm. yep. 73 days in the arctic you know let's let's kind of rewind and dive into what gets you into ancestral skills is this something you discover as a child is it a family thing that gets passed down yeah, that's a great question. So it wasn't, it was not a family thing for me. Um, it was definitely an interest from the time I was a teeny kid. Like all of my, all of my games as a kid were like running around pretending I was harvesting wild food and they'd be like little, you know, weed seed heads and like tucking them into little, you know, cracks in the rock. And so it was definitely a passion of mine. But for me, I did feel like it was play because it was not what I was raised with. I was raised in like a a rural area, but you know, like a, a little neighborhood in a homeowner's community. So it wasn't what we, we grew strawberries, you know, but we were not homesteading or roughing it by any means. Um, and then when I was in college, I was turned on to the work of Tom Brown and the idea that there are still people teaching ancestral skills. Um, and so I, when I was 19, I got told about one of these gatherings that people um, come together and teach the skills at. And so that totally changed the course of my life. And from that point on, that was 1995. And it just became the entire focus of my world from that time. That's, so, in, that's incredible. It's been a minute. And, and of course, as a, you, yeah. you come from, I come from divorced parents, you come from divorced parents, you're an only child. So you're probably familiar with spending a lot of time alone. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Like knowing how to play by myself and be my own best friend is one of my oldest skills. And, you know, I'm a super social person. And so some of my friends were like, how is that going to be for you? But I think I'm really, I'm an extroverted introvert. Mm -hmm. So I really crave time alone. So there were ways that that was my favorite part of the whole thing. And the ability to go really deep with a landscape, I feel like is really different when you're on your own versus when you're with people. Because when you're with other humans, then you naturally go to them for your, your social interaction. But when you're not, you're finding it all around you. And so like, I never felt lonely. Yeah, I loved the the place and I connected so deeply with every tree, every animal, every rock with that lake. I mean, this amazing lake. So, yeah, there's definitely a strength for me out there. And that connection to to what you're saying is you had such a connection with nature and and watching you when you did get those kills and the respect that you had and, and the 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 real just genuine adoration you gave to that animal is something that I feel like we're so divorced from. And me as I'm a classically trained chef, and I think people are just so accustomed to opening up the fridge and there's food there, there's always food there. And you just take everything for granted and you go, okay, this is great. And, and to really have that connection with food, I know some people are you know, on the fence about having to kill things or you know, there's, there's all sorts of type of people, but when you have to survive, you have to survive. And, and the way, I just love the way that you paid that respect to the food. 
Thank you. Yeah, that feels super, super key. And you know, the, the timing of Alone season six going on Netflix was amazing because that happened right at the height of coronavirus and shutdowns. And I think that that did so much for people who were really freaking out and who like couldn't get everything that they wanted for the first time ever. And then to be able to watch me and my season and be like, oh, wait, like I don't have exactly what I want, but I have food and, and I'm that's warm. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and warm, right, yeah, and shelter that I didn't have to build with a minimal of tools and all that. So yeah, but you know, that that respect for food, obviously, I've never been in such a situation with so little before. I mean, I have short term on Stone Age trips, but like, you know, going for months without, without any food but what I could procure and way less than I needed um, was huge. So I've never felt such a deep connection to my food and so much you know, respect for it, but eating wild and respect for, for wild and like cultivating a relationship with not having enough so that we appreciate what we have has definitely been a big part of my life way before mm -hmm. alone. And then that just like, wow, multiplied that sense exponentially. Yeah. I think that's, you know, I started getting into, um, fasting, you know, from a health benefit as well, but I think it's also the notion of trying to do, do more with less. And, and we are, we are so conditioned, yeah. especially as Americans, it's, it's more, more, more. You want to have more on your plate. People are always trying to overfeed you and, and, and to be happier with less. And you, you see, you see it where we have so much and yet we're, we're some of the most unhappy people in the world. And yet I'll, I'll travel, you'll go to countries where you see people who they have family, they usually have their religion or something like that. And they have nothing else. They're not making a ton of money and they're just the happiest people in the world. Exactly. Yeah. It's like the more you have, the less you appreciate it. So that's, you know, in a lot of my teachings, not, not as much before alone, but since then, just really understanding the gift of lack, mm -hmm. you know, like the, it is a gift to not have as much as you want sometimes, because it's the only way you're really going to appreciate all of those gifts that you have. And yeah, our culture is one of the most entitled culture in the world. And I think that an experience like I had out there would behoove every every person in this country certainly i mean every person in the world who doesn't already get this get experiences like that because they're in a place where they don't have what they need which obviously is very common in other places besides the us but yeah i mean i just think that is one of the most enriching and important experiences a person can have i really do how much does mindfulness obviously with i see how everything with your with the the food that you've killed but um how much just did you have to distract yourself? Was there a meditative aspect to it? Was it just you staying busy and trying to um, just by the the sheer act of trying to stay alive, uh, kept your mind, uh, uh, you know, in a certain place? Or how did you deal with the mental ramifications? Yeah, that's a great question. And that comes up a lot because if you've watched other seasons of Alone and even on my season, you know, they really focus on that. And like, what do you do with all that empty time? And how do you relieve the pressure? Like I never had an empty second. Yeah. You were always on a journey. <laughs> well, and like I had something I had to do sure. to live every second of every day and every daylight hour. I mean, by the time I left, we had less than four hours of good daylight. So there was not a moment to lose ever. And I knew from the moment I was dropped that I was preparing for that time of, you know, maybe just a couple, if I made it through the winter, like maybe half an hour of daylight for some of those days. So yeah, there was never an empty moment. And yes, just keeping myself sheltered, fed, and with enough firewood took every second of every day. That said, I am a person who loves hard work and loves to drive myself and loves a good challenge. So like that wasn't a problem for me. And I mean, I like building that shelter was so much fun. Like I didn't it, have to peel every single <laughs> pole for that shelter, but it was beautiful. It was and I loved it. Amazing. Like, Your process. Yeah, but the workmanship was so inspiring. Your process was so vastly different <laughs> than everybody. You see everybody when they're kind of panning around to each different shelter and you see like Jordan, this kind of tent kind of situation. And then other people who just have a, like, like a, you know, a little bit of an A-frame maybe. I looked over yours and I was like, what is, this is like a log cabin. It's like beautifully everything. It's like two log cabins, was, one on the outside and then a littler one inside. You've got a door, you've got a whole, I mean, you had a whole setup. I was like, I would live in this all the time. I mean, I, I think if you would have, oh, yeah. the, the food would have been a little more abundant. You, you literally could have moved over there. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was setting up for. I was like, heck yeah, I am here for the winter. Like I could, if I, you know, 
and I knew that food was going to be an issue, but I knew that the weather was going to be an issue before food was. So it's like, you know, if I don't have, if I don't have food, I can still be here for a long time sure. with the shelter. If I don't have shelter, you know, the first blizzard is going to take me out and it's the freaking Arctic. So the first blizzard could be tomorrow. And as it turned out, we got our first snowstorm day three. I woke up the morning of day three covered in snow because I had like the basic A frame right. set up, but I didn't have the walls filled in. So I just kept being, I'd be like, okay, today's the day I'm going to really dig in and get food. And then a storm would blow in and I'm like, no, no food today. Shelter. Shelter, shelter, shelter. Yeah, that's the thing. So, you could have all the food in the world, but then it's just you and the food sitting out in the elements and it's, you're just living in a refrigerator <laughs> yeah. or a freezer. So, and I would still, you know, I was putting a lot of energy towards food that they didn't show. Like I was fishing every single day. But one thing that you don't see in the show is that I had a foot and a half depth all around me. I was on this teeny rocky peninsula and it was just shallow, shallow, shallow. I had no shot at fish ever, you know, like because we can't travel out of a certain zone. So... Was I that... was on a peninsula and to get to the mainland, I'd have to get to the mainland and then a mile or more up shore in order to get to deep enough water to fish. That w It seemed like fishing was a problem for a lot of people. There wasn't fishing from shore did not seem like it was an option for anybody. You had to kind of come up with some no, kind of... No, a lot of people did. Oh, they... There were like Nathan was fishing from shore. Jordan was fishing from shore. Um, Ray caught fish from shore. Brady caught a bunch of... Uh, Barry. So actually a lot of people did, but, but some of us just didn't have deep water. You know, it just depended where you were. Some, some places there are on big drop-offs right. and you have, you know, hundreds and thousands of feet of depth right offshore. And some, you would have to go 200 yards away from shore to get to steep, deep water, which was my case. Like once, once it froze up and I was able to get out on that ice, I saw why I never had a shot at catching fish. Like I had to hike for almost half a mile out on the ice to get to where I would have want, wanted to drop the line. It was just so, so intense. What was the strange, well, so <laughs> did you have, were there areas that they kept you in that you couldn't oh, go? Yeah. Okay, because I, yeah, I didn't, yeah. no, I didn't know if it was a self-imposed. You get in a zone because right. they don't want you running to, into one another. Of course. They want to know that they can come and get you if an emergency happens. And that's just the that's just the rules of the show. It's You never know exactly what your bounds are mm -hmm. until you cross them. Because obviously it's not like there's a fence out there, sure. you know, 400 kilometers from the nearest town. Um, so there's a geo fence. So it's set up where, if, where you're wearing a GPS device. Mm -hmm. And if you go beyond your perimeter then you get a message saying turn around got it i so, couldn't i couldn't tell if it was something that you know obviously you energy expenditure is such a huge issue out there i didn't know if it was something self-imposed where you guys were like well i don't want to go out past you know a mile this way or x amount this way because you have to burn those calories to get in and get out so I, right. I, 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 that's interesting to hear that the show said you have to stay in this zone yeah and the calories is a big one too like i did three big forays mm -hmm. deep you know, into into the mainland in different directions, looking like I glassed the landscape and I was like, okay, where where does all of the land point to? Where am I most likely to find actual water that could be a lake of depth as opposed to the shore where I have no shot? So I did a couple hikes trying to find that spot and spent like all day hiking up and down rough terrain. And I was like, I didn't find a lake in the most likely spot. So I have to stop looking because I'm just burning up burning calories, calories. Yeah. with no idea whether or not this is going to return them. Or even if I did find a lake at this point, would those fish that I have to hike this far for be, worth be more it. calories than I'm spending? <laughs> That's the insane thing that you only think about if you're out in the middle of nature by yourself. What is right. the strangest thing that you saw either in, in that in that show or just in general in nature because you you obviously spend more time in nature than any you know, most nor, you know quote unquote normal people yeah normal it's all relative like does bigfoot um, exist is that what i'm getting <laughs> i've heard some stories i know some folks who have seen some things but uh but i haven't personally um but no i'll tell you one of the weirdest things that happened to me that's not exactly like pure nature but it was crazy um so one day it was pretty early on. It was like my shelter wasn't totally built yet. Um, and I always tried to call it my cabin instead of shelter because I felt like shelter implies short term, mm -hmm. whereas cabin is like I live here. It was and a cabin, was to, be <laughs> to be fair. To be fair, it was. <laughs> and there's that. It right? could have been in a magazine. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I actually did a little Better Homes and Gardens tour of it with like a nice British accent and stuff. And they didn't put that in the show. I could, I was like, really? Come on. I would have enjoyed so that. Good. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so it's early on. I'm working on my shelter. I had um, sill logs down on the inside that I would kind of wedge those vertical poles mm -hmm. against to hold everything in place. And I had put 
one in like late at night. I worked by headlamp a lot because it kept me warm. Like it was a great way to stay warm when the temperatures dropped, um, was working on that and working on things that were inside anyway. So I wasn't, you know, losing daylight to be working on those at night. Um, but I laid a log in the evening and then the next day was one of those long forays that I did. And I ended up being out and finding an area where beaver had recently chewed up a bunch of alder branches. And they actually showed this on one of the episodes. They show me saying, oh, look at this pile of alder branches. Mm -hmm. And they then splice it. So I say, this is from a moose, which is ridiculous. Oh, I remember you walking through, yeah, yeah. Chew up and drop pot. No, that's what beaver do. It was beaver sign. And I said that, but they like splice two different things. So anyway, so I was like, okay, well, beaver are largely crepuscular, meaning active dawn and dusk and nocturnal. So I'm coming back here tonight in case these beaver come back for these chewed alder logs. So I was way away from my shelter at night, which I didn't typically do, but because I was out there and I was in a different part of the landscape, I had a view to the north and I could see it in the North Star. And I was like, oh, that's like 10 degrees off from where I had it pegged based on the sun setting. So wow, now I know exactly where north is. And the next day I was in my shelter and I was going to lay more logs in. And I looked down at that sill log I had laid the day before and there was a sticker on that like a clear sticker and on that sticker was a letter n a capital letter n and then i looked at it and it was exactly lined up with polar north that's that's crazy it was crazy so i was like okay so either one i felled a tree out in the woods in the middle of the nowhere that had a letter n on it and then i limbed it and then put it in my shelter without seeing that it had a sticker or someone like someone on the medical team snuck into my shelter and stuck an end to mark north while i was away from no because they come in a helicopter or a boat right. i would hear them known, and they yeah. wouldn't do that they don't mess with us like it's hands off or three something on some of my gear had a sticker and i didn't realize it and it like smushed against that log such that it swiped the sticker off so that the sticker was exactly upright and exactly lined up with polar north mother like nature all of those are impossible but one of them happened mother nature is uh she definitely had your back for for some things then <laughs> yeah and that's just one of the like crazy magic things that was like yeah the universe wants me here and is letting me know it but i think that's that's to who you are though you are one with that universe you didn't try to go in and, and you wanted to live with the nature. Like, I think that's the problem with, you know, Western society, you go in and you're manipulating nature. It's something that if you look at, um, you know, we get angry when we're in the water and a shark attacks and we expect a shark to not act like a shark or we expect, you know, you're up in Northern California where people build houses in the middle of a fire lane. And right. we expect that we're everyone, and it's not, not to diminish anybody's loss, but we expect nature to kind of go around us instead of we don't know how to understand how to and there's the and you want to go back to ancestral practices letting the native americans doing controlled burns to actually take care of all of that fuel right yeah yeah so we're living in fire adapted climates and then we control all fires so that the fuel levels build up like crazy so that the fires don't just happen and sweep through quickly they become catastrophic with these super intense heats from the super intense fuel loads and then and then we're like why is this not that global climate change isn't part of it it's it definitely is, part of it but certainly a lot of it is human yeah and like hey we're having more mountain lion attacks these days well of course we are we're building further and further into these pristine places they have nowhere else to go and they and we're like decimating their prey populations from fences and roadways and taking away water and putting it in pipes and yeah, yeah exactly it's weird we're, that we like we're so entitled we expect the world to work around us and that's not actually how it works and then be a weirdly upset when a predator acts like a predator and does what they're right. supposed to do yeah. is there anything that you regret bringing uh, or anything you wish you had brought into the woods because i know you get 10 items um, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that there were people who, some people probably thought bringing a bow and arrow was not the right call or is the right call. Or I remember, I forgot who it was. Didn't bring the, um, what's the fire starter? The, the ferro rod. The ferro yeah, rod. Nathan, yeah. The ferro rod, and which then, was bold in that climate. Yeah. Very bold. And almost took him out. It, that, it would have taken him out if, if there hadn't been like a cedar cutting board that had washed up. Like he was dependent on debris from humans out there. So yeah, but yeah, I mean, so here's the thing is that I feel like given the information I had, I chose well, because I knew that this is one of the best fishing lakes in the world. People come from all over the world to fish there, 
but it's a crapshoot whether or not you get deep water. So that fishing line did nothing for me. So it would have been, and, and at the last minute, I had been planning to bring snare wire until the last minute, but I was planning to use it in place of cordage for things like building and all of the crafting that I needed. But the wind was so fierce in the storms, even before we left. Um, you know, before they put us on the ground, that I was picturing, you know, a shelter put together with snare wire and mm. the wind flapping my tarp. And, you know, it goes back and forth a couple of times and your wire is going to break. Gone, yeah. And plus, you know, I knew that I didn't have experience snaring. I knew how to, but I had never done it. So I was like, well, no one has successfully ever snared on a loan before. And I've never snared. And I know that I'm going to need paracord. So at the last minute, I switched out my paracord for snare wire. Thank God. And <laughs> Well, I'm glad I had the paracord, yeah. but snare wire, like I, I did some trapping, yeah, yeah, but that's... I was so handicapped by not having snare wire. Like the fact that I brought it in as much as I did with a handicap of no snare wire was absurd. Everybody else, not everybody, but a lot, most of the folks, okay, everybody else you've ever seen catch game on alone with snaring is because they were using snare wire. Wait, did you not, what was the wire that you used to catch because you caught? I, didn't, I used my fishing line, which oh. is not wire which rabbits can snip right through in a heartbeat with their teeth. I thought that was snare wire. Okay. No, no, they didn't really advertise that. They didn't really advertise how handicapped I was. Because I saw so you like, snaring things and I just assumed because you see everyone else that has snare wire. Yeah. No. Wow. So like 95% of the things I caught snipped their way out. Yeah, I remember you see every time you'd go. And I, that's what kind of baffled me as well when I would see it and you'd be like, oh, they broke away or oh, and then or you'd have animals come in and eat the animal that was you know snared. That's yeah. wow. That's pretty. But, but that's a thing too, right? And that you see people um, like Michelle, they, they kind of contrasted me and Michelle and foxes were getting Michelle's rabbits and she was super pissed off and rabbits, uh, foxes were getting mine too. And that's a bummer because I needed that food. But like, I can't be pissed about that. I'm in their territory after the same food as them. So like, of course, they're going to take it from me if they can and more power to them. But I, I needed to be smarter than them, you know, I needed to be on my game. So I would start checking my snares different times of day and I would like go a roundabout way to get to my snare. So I wasn't making a path that was easy for them to just follow because they would run my trap line right before I did. They knew right where all of my traps were and clean it out. Wow. So it was gnarly. Yeah, that's totally gnarly. So kind of rewinding a little bit where like I know that obviously you didn't gain these skills overnight and you have gone on all these different adventures and and um and gone into nature way more than you know you just leading up to the show so just give me a rewind of like of step by step I know you went to school as well you studied you are you can speak well about so many different subjects I just love to hear how you got to being where you are now yeah, well, you know, it's a great question because when I was in undergrad, that's when I first started doing um, the skill stuff. And I definitely was torn whether to stay in school or quit school and just do nothing but the skill stuff. But I also, I went to UC Santa Cruz and I was mm -hmm. studying biology and botany. And so a lot of my classes were outdoors and I actually lived illegally in the Redwood Forest Amazing. during college. So it was like of anywhere I could have been to college, that was a spot where I could really do both. You know, I was tanning hides out in the, out in the woods. Um, so, and then, and then I went through this phase of out of college and doing more of the skill stuff, but also working in environmental ed. So doing stuff, you know, with kids, nature camps with kids and stuff. And, um, and, you know, working seasonally and being pretty unstable. And then I kind of went through a period and honestly it had largely to do with my relationship when I was with a man who was um, to be my, my husband, um, where, you know, he really, like I was much more, um, I was interested in a very different lifestyle than him. Mm -hmm. And I kind of compromised and, and kind of started, you know, working a more regular job and living a more regular life because I recognized, because he was important to me and I just wasn't sure if it was gonna be sustainable for me, like socially, emotionally um, to be doing the skills full time. So I went through this period of like, I guess I have to grow up and you know be an adult and get a real job. And I was miserable. Like I was suicidally miserable. It was awful. And when, when he and I split, um, it was kind of this big like reclaiming who I was and my life back. I, I was in graduate school. I was getting my master's degree at the time. And I like 
quit my master's thesis. I divorced my husband. I moved out of our three bedroom house on the outskirts of town and I ran off to Northern Ontario to live with native people and I never looked back. I did look back to the US because we got booted out by immigration, but I never looked back in terms of centering the skills and the lifestyle I wanted. So since then, you know, I've liked, I, I lived off in, in like, bush in the bush in crown land in northern Ontario north of where the roads went I've lived off grid in Wisconsin and on a homestead in Oregon um, started a primitive skills school in Oregon for years um, so I've done a lot of different things but they all have had these skills centered um, and so yeah so it's been 25 years of practicing this skill so there's a reason why like the being out there and those skills part and being on my own in the wilderness didn't feel like a big deal to me on a loan. It, it wasn't. There's nothing like, like a, the Arctic was. There's nothing but. like a, a good divorce to kick you in the ass. For me, I know that um, I went through I went through a really shitty divorce, and it was a very public divorce. Um, but had I not gone through that pain, had I not, I wouldn't have ever become a chef. I wouldn't have realized a whole nother part. You know, for you, it sounds like you rediscovered who you originally were, and it seemed like you were trying to fit yourself into this mold and, and, uh, and, you know, be more normal, so to speak. So you probably felt suffocated. Uh, yeah. and, and for me, I, you know, had I not gotten out, out from under that, I would have never, you know, I wouldn't be doing this today. I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have met all the people, you know, it's just how it's interesting how one shitty catastrophic thing in that moment. And if you can just get through that moment and to the other side, there's so much, so yeah. much better on the other side. Yeah, and then you have something to compare to. Like if I had just done the skills all my life, I'm sure I would have had that. Like, I wonder, like, what if I had been a doctor or a lawyer like my dad wanted, you know? But then I was like, You'd oh yeah, miserable. no, I remember what it felt like <laughs> to try doing the normal thing. And I remember like thinking about veering my car into oncoming traffic because I was so unhappy. Like, it's pretty clear that's not for me. So I'm good. Like I'm all about what I'm doing. And that's another thing too, like what it is to go through such pain and have your whole life torn apart. You know, when I was out there and sometimes what they would come and do medical checks and they ask you a question, they'd be like, talk to the camera about how hard this is and how it's the hardest thing you've ever done. And I was like, oh my God, are you kidding me? Like, no. My, leaving my husband, tearing apart my whole life and breaking the heart of this person who I loved so much, that was freaking hard. This is fun. Like there, there's a lot of beauty in what I'm doing now. I'm starving and it's really cold, but it's so many beautiful things. Like the divorce, there's nothing sweet about that. It was no. awful, you know? It, that's so definitely like, the hardest thing you can go through in life. Yeah, so you have that to compare everything else to. And by contrast, starving in the wilderness for a couple months, no problem. <laughs> I just love the fact that first of all, your 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 whole spirited energy is amazing. I couldn't imagine you being any. I couldn't imagine you being a nine to five person. I just think it's it's so funny because and one of the reasons I was so interested to get to know you and talk to you is that survivalists and nature. It's such a male dominated thing, and it seems like such a I'm a man in the woods, and I, I feel like such a wimp now talking to you. I feel you know I'm like I would be. I mean I can cook. And I could probably go out and forage for things, but I feel worthless. You're making your own clothing, which I definitely want to dive into as well. Is, okay, is I, I, I would be out there and I, I could probably like get by and I'd be like, yeah, then like my mind would take over. I would not know what the fuck I'm doing, putting together a shelter. <laughs> like, I, I've been camping. I love camping. I grew up in Michigan. I went to the woods. I went to the lake. Yeah, would, it's different when there's no respite, right? Yeah. I mean, like, and I've, you know, I've done a lot of woodsy things, obviously, but I've, I've often had somewhere else to go. But like, people always talk about how hard it was and how cold it must have been. But it's like, when you don't have a heated cabin to contrast it to, you get, it's just life. Like, you just deal with what's presented to you any moment. And I think that's the thing, too. Like, I just considered that I was there until the experience was over, until someone came and told me it was over. And therefore, I never considered that button a way to go home. Like, that button didn't exist to me. So I wasn't tortured by, like, whether or not to push the button if things got hard. Like, there was no button. This was my life, and I did what I had to do to make it work, and that was all there was. And that's that's the reality for every generation up until the last like 10 gener like that was just living for most people. Well, I was going to so. say that's the metaphor for life. There is no button. There's no, right. there's no easy button. There's no eject button. You're in it. So yeah. learn how to deal with it, learn how to cope with it and learn how to move forward. I think it's incredible because yeah. you, I mean, if I was a young girl watching the show, cause you know, there's so many, I feel like that's a, you know, the exposure to that 
it's not really seen and, and to see a, a, a woman thriving in nature is it, you must feel a, a sense of responsibility to to teach other generations as you're doing now well i mean that was a big part of why i went kind of like like you talked about like the idea that our culture gives us that like survival is for like men and particularly like for military men and this like tough it out and like man versus you know like man versus wild is the name of one of the most popular like right. versus there's no versus like the, it should be with right so i was like woman with nature not man versus wild and i know the man versus wild isn't like trying to be gender specific it's like human versus wild except that it is a manly man in that case but you know, so I was very conscious of the fact that I was out there to represent an alternative to the, the you know, the typical idea of what survival looks like in our culture. And I wanted to be very clear that I was there as a woman and that part of my strength was in my femininity. And they let that come through in the editing a teeny bit. But like I specific, I brought a... Um, uh, a buff we got to take two buffs to keep our neck warm and I brought one that was really oversized and I lost weight pretty quick out there and I ended up pulling it down and wearing it like a skirt like we didn't get to bring a skirt as part of our clothing list they tell you you can take you know one this and one that and two sweaters and so but I wore it specifically because I wanted to be feminine out there because it's like usually even if you see women in these things they're often cast as these like really burly more masculine energy women women and i i was like no like my femininity is a strength out here and the way i interact with and respect and connect with this landscape that's my strength that's not that's not a handicap and you like i got so many comments like oh you did really good for a woman mm, and i'm like the qualifier for a woman yeah screw you let's like, see you do it yeah. yeah let's see you do it <laughs> asshole for three days <laughs> I mean, I never responded like that. I mean, I can respond like that. The whole idea that women shouldn't be able to do this is ridiculous. Well, the whole idea that women shouldn't be able to do anything is, is that anybody shouldn't be able to do anything. It really comes down to a mindset. And yeah, I noticed, I was like, where did she get that skirt from? I didn't know that. I thought, so, okay, now I know where the origin of that was. That was, that was a hack of our wardrobe I mean, granted, I, I totally did wear it as a neck thing too. Mm -hmm. But in the winter, one of my prime garments is what I call a kidney warmer. So it goes from like just below my rib cage to down just over my butt, because that's the area where there's usually a gap mm. in our clothes. And like your kidneys are super sensitive. And in Asian cultures, um, often considered like the, the seat of your energy and your power is in your kidneys. And so here we have these gaps in our clothes and we're just letting all of that warmth and energy out. And so I brought it as a buff with the idea to wear it as a kidney wrap, but I got so skinny so fast. I lost a pound a day for the first three weeks. Yeah, every... The first medical check was day 21 and I was 21 pounds down. So that kidney wrap became a skirt really quick, yeah. faster than I thought it would. But you're no yeah. stranger to making your own clothing. I, I see you're, you're, I'm assuming you're wearing one of your creations right now. Yeah. So tan, tan the hides mm -hmm. and then, um, Actually, you know, my dear friend Jay tanned this hide. I tanned this hide. It's a couple different hides. But um, but yeah, so that's a huge part of what I do. And, you know, Buckskin Revolution, my business name, part of, part of the work is I teach hide tanning and sewing your own clothing out of buckskin. And, you know, that's a thing, too, where it's like considered, though, sewing. It's like a wussy feminine art. And I considered bringing a sewing kit as one of my 10 items. It's allowable, but no one has ever brought it. So when I asked them, like, what would that look like? And they were like, oh, we don't actually know. We've never actually defined what the sewing kit is because no one was ever going to bring it. It's kind of like a joke item for them. But I'm like, no, being able to repair your own gear yeah. when you're out there is huge. Your life depends on that gear. Like your clothing is your shelter most of your time most of your time isn't sitting huddled by your fire so to be able to do your own so i didn't bring the sewing kit but what i did is i brought and i have it here somewhere i can probably find it but um, i brought a, a leatherman mm -hmm. that a friend of mine and i worked together he he made a bunch of modifications to it for me and he's someone who i've taught buckskin sewing so he knows what i like in a sewing all so i brought that leatherman specifically because of the scissors the pliers and then the the all that we made to go in it and so i was able to sew out there i remember you um, yeah watching you sew and i was like how is she doing this right now when you made that you're like because i didn't i didn't think about a bunny you really can't do much with the fur as far as like making a large piece of clothing so you like yeah it's really really thin you bring it all it's out and then you kind of made you know which you're no stranger to making i was reading something how you made one of the things you taught yourself how to make uh to spin 
Wool, not wool. Where did you learn how to spin? Uh... The first spinning I did was with a mountain goat, like a shed yeah. mountain goat hide that I found in the Rocky Mountains backpacking. Because in the spring, they shed them in these big wads. So I found that and I like hauled, it was the Tetons. I hauled that out of the Tetons because I knew I could do something with it. And that prompted me to go and teach myself to spin. And then I got into spinning and got a spinning wheel and, um, and then felted. And then that was before I was ever tanning hides or doing the ancestral skills. So it's funny you throw, I mean, obviously you're so comfortable with, with saying tanning hides and doing this. Most people don't know even what is the process of, of tanning a, with that. Because a lot of people I know, especially, you know, some parents say, I'm going to tan your hide. It means you're going to spank your ass. So that's, that's the only yeah, familiar. Generally, you have to remove the skin first is the thing. Yeah. Just spanking doesn't do it. Good yeah, to so know. step one, getting the hide off the animal. Um, yeah. So it depends. There's a lot of different styles of tanning. So what I do are all um, natural processes. So brain tanning which is similar processes are found all over the world, but brain tanning is mostly associated with the indigenous people of North America, um, or most recently, like easiest to trace back. And then bark tanning, which is more of a European tradition and kind of an old world tradition. Um, so for both of those, you know, obviously skinning the hide well and then fleshing them. So you're working with just the skin. And then for brain tan, which is what I'm wearing now, you're actually taking off the outer layer of the skin, the shiny, what we call grain leather for like belts and boots and um, the part that's waterproof, you take that off and then you work a solution of grains and water, or you can use substitutes. You can use egg yolks or soy lecithin or oil. Is but it just some kind of en grain, enzyme in the brain that breaks down? Uh, there are a few enzymes, but it's not really an enzymatic process. Okay. It's more um, a lubricating process. So brains are a fat Got it. that's soluble in water. So, so they, they get into the middle of the hide and they spread those oils all over the fibers and then you're physically working the hide soft. So as opposed to chemical processes and even bark tan processes, um, it's more that the, 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 the things you're soaking them in kind of change the leather and make it soft. But with brain tanning, the brains are just assisting you in being able to work it soft by hand. So it's a very physical process. Is that where the twisting? Constantly. Yeah, I was, I was seeing. Yeah, you, I mean, you twist to wring the solution through, the dressing of the brains through, but it's also you're working the hide constantly as it's going from wet to dry and keeping every fiber constantly in motion so that it can't get stuck together like it does in rawhide. Um, so yeah, so that's brain tanning. And then bark tanning is more soaking the hide in a solution of, of a, a tea made from bark or there's all kinds of other substances that have tannins in them. And then those tannins are, are changing the hide at a molecular level and bonding the fibers so yeah, I mean it's a huge vast subject that we could talk I, for an hour just. I love I love yeah, nerdy. It looks like fluffing hide, cleaning it. Yeah. The, the only tannins <laughs> I know of are the ones in my wine glass. So that's that's all I've been familiar with. Is just. Well, that's a thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, it'd be a beautiful hide if you tanned it with grape skins. <laughs> Dang. Yeah. How much are how much clothing can you create from? Uh, what's your most common animal that you would you would kill in the wild? Would it be a deer? Would it be, you know? Uh, I mean, deer, I, I work most, and I, I have not successfully, I've gone deer hunting a couple of times. I have yet to take a deer myself, but certainly I intend to maybe, maybe this season, that would be great. Fingers crossed. Um, so, but I've, I've done a lot of other hunting. Yeah. Thank you. And I would love to bow hunt. Like I feel, you know, I'm, I'm a good shot with a rifle, but that feels like not quite cheating it far back enough yeah. like my ambition certainly is to shoot my first deer with a bow i've made myself um but yeah deer deer hide is by far the most common hide that i work with um but i also do you know all kinds of furs and now that it's legal to pick up roadkill in california it's been legal a lot of other places um you can pick up roadkill so often what i'm tanning is what i happen to find but i also i raised rabbits for meat for years and so i've tanned a ton of rabbit hides um so yeah, whatever whatever I can access is what I'm tanning. Goats, sheep, elk, antelope, rabbits, raccoons, foxes, you know, I mean, you name it. So aside from the 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 tanning and the clothing making, what are some other ancestral practices that you're teaching that would be easy to implement? Because I know a lot of people probably they hear ancestral, you know, anything and they're like, oh, this is this sounds crazy. I'm, you know, and I think they're probably there's probably a more accessibility to it than most people realize. Exactly, yeah, which, which is a great point because today 
is the launch of a gathering that I'm offering, Amazing. which is a, an ancestral skills and land-based skills. So like today is the first day registration is open and I'm going to make up a coupon for your listeners I love it. so they can register with a special coupon. Um, but what I try to focus on now is specifically what you're saying. I try to teach those skills that are easy to incorporate into folks' daily lives. You know, I've done all of the Stone Age stuff. Like I can make, I'm not good at, at like really fine flint napping and making arrowheads and spear points, but I can make, you know, sharp rocks that I can skin an animal pretty easily with, you know, um, and I can, and like friction fire and all of those things. I do those things and I've taught a lot of those things, but most people aren't going to be making a friction fire in their living room to get their soup cooking, you know, but clothing is something most people wear every day. Food is something most people eat every day. Like the medicine that keeps you well is something people really need wherever they are. So those are a lot of things that I focus on teaching. So um, fiber arts, spinning and felting, um, the buckskin tanning and sewing, but wild foods and food preservation are a huge, a huge part of what I do and what I focus on. Um, and that's something where, you know, you can harvest something that's abundant seasonally and you can put a bunch of it up for the rest of the year and you can have a little bit every every day or a couple times a week and that really does something to you to know that you're connected to those wild places you know whenever you make that nettle tea you remember what it was out what it was like to be out you know putting those nettles into your basket or your shopping bag or whatever it is and you feel more connected to those wild places around you even if you're in an apartment in the bronx and i have a lot of people in my gatherings in apartments in the bronx and I'm still talking about how to connect in with the natural world. You know, you have a window, you have the sky, you have the clouds, you have the birds, you have the weeds growing in the vacant lot that you walk past on your way to work. So everyone has access wherever they are. It just might look really different. Yeah, I think that that's the one thing that kind of going back to not having the connection with the food. I have friends who are successful hunters who they even tell me every time they go to put something on the grill or when they're feeding their family, like they're, they're kind of hearkened back to being in nature and, and remembering that kill and respecting it. And I think that's just, there's something so incredible about that, that connection that I just, I want to be able to get back to, even for myself, who I feel like pretty um, aware of these things, you know, making, making and canning and preserving food and learning different preservation techniques. I know what I can, but beyond that, like, I don't know exactly, you know, how how I would survive if I was just out in the, in nature. So I would love to know more about what what are some of the techniques that you teach as far as preservation. Yeah. So yeah, those are things that I talk about all the time and what it is to know how to do this stuff, even if you're not doing it regularly, what it does for you inside to know that you have that knowledge, mm -hmm. particularly when things like coronavirus happens and everyone's absolutely freaked out and panicking and just watching the shelves empty, you know, like it it changes something deep inside us, even if we're not doing it every day. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I try to teach those things that are really accessible. So, you know, drying and fermenting and canning, and I teach pressure canning too, but that's, you know, a little bit more involved for a lot of folks. But yeah, like food security issues are, are things that I talk about a lot. Um, you know, I did a bunch of videos about how to use your car as a dehydrator really? last fall in California, because when the, when we have fires threatening, they turn the power off so that the lines don't start more fires. So people's, you know, people were losing tons of food because their freezers were out and they didn't, couldn't plug in a dehydrator. So like, here's how to use your car to dehydrate your food. So you don't lose all your food when the power goes out. That's so it's amazing. a lot of practical things that you can apply. Another thing about wild foods that are so key is most of the wild foods are infinitely healthier and more nutritious than the food you can buy at the grocery store. You know, like wild venison compared oh, to best. hamburger that came out of a feedlot. I mean, it's huge. Like the food value in what you're eating is tenfold. Yeah, for and me. You can feel that. Yeah, for me, that's the thing. Everyone, you know, everyone wants to talk about. They're always asking me, you know, what food should I eat? What diet should I eat? And I always tell them to try to find the most nutritionally dense foods they can possibly find, and those come from whatever you can have the closest, that's why farmer's markets, or if you can get out and forage, you know, if you live in a community that, you know, a lot of people live in food deserts, so they unfortunately don't have access to that, which is incredibly sad, but it really nutritional den density and value is, is way more paramount than any special diet you could ever, you know, imagine. Exactly. And I do, you know, that same during coronavirus, I was doing classes on YouTube on sprouting, you know, you can buy a bunch of seeds and you can grow a salad on your windowsill wherever you are. Even if you're in a food desert, you can be creative and find solutions. And, you know, I came out to like be with my mom who's in her late seventies 
during coronavirus and to like make sure that she had exactly that, like the most nutrient dense foods available and that she was set up for a long time should we have really lasting shortages um, because your health is so closely tied with what you eat. And our culture just does an abysmal job at addressing that. And, you know, we have really bad habits in our culture. Um, so yeah, just trying to address it in the little ways that we can and just kind of like ease in because people freak out if they have a huge yeah. shift really quick. But like, can you find a way to just get a little bit more green into your into your diet every day or yeah, find those nutritional. And I think I wish we could. I wish we could get. I'm. I'm a huge. Uh, a lot of my training is, is with Asian food, and there's a lot of fermented foods within that. And I think we could eliminate a lot of food waste. How much food just gets pitched away because no one knows what to do with these odds or ends, and they can only make so many frittatas or whatever they want to do with all these extra vegetable scraps. And I. And and if more people knew about not only saving money by, um, by by saving all those scraps. But also how good fermented foods are for your gut and the connection between your gut and your brain and the rest of your body would be a huge thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's, yeah, a lot of people live in food deserts and there are so many things that we could do that most people don't because they don't know how. Like even if you live in a food desert, can you get go out somewhere where you can get, you know, like seven heads of cabbage all at one time and then bring those back and make enough kimchi or sauerkraut to last you for a year. Um, and then you're getting those live enzymes, you're getting those raw vitamins, you're getting you're getting all those probiotics. That's something that I've been incredibly passionate about and I've, I've tried to rack my brain so much of how to either come up with a cookbook that could, would be applicable to people who are in food deserts finding things, but it's so different in every market and I don't know and I don't know if there, or if there's a government assistance program, like what's allotted. I wish that I had a better scope of that to be able to teach people to do the best with, with what they have. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a book, Food Not Lawns, that's about, about, you know, like people being more resilient and doing more with what they have. And, you know, I mean, there's, there's container gardens on your, on your porch, or there's all kinds of ways to be creative. And, you know, as you say, it's, it's not about one solution because everyone is in a different situation. That's another thing with how I try to live and what I try to teach is not like, here's what you do, but like, here's how to think more creatively about these problems and make your own solutions and tweak your solutions to what actually works where you are and in your life. And that's what I think the problem with a lot of survival instruction is there's a lot of rules. There's the rule of threes and there's, this is the order of your priorities. And first you do this and then you do that. And I'm like, yeah, but what, that's the same in the Arctic and in the desert and in the tropics? No, of course it isn't. Like it's completely different in every situation. And we need to teach people how to think and how to be adaptability rather than memorize these rules. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, a rule for humans in general. It's just, how to be adaptable to the environment. And that's something that you said, like, I want to watch women with women with nature. I think that's the next show for you to, to be, because it's, it's really, instead of trying to enforce your will upon the wild, it's really living in harmony and adapting to your environment and, and being able to sort of thrive as you, as you call it. I think that's, that's the key. So what can we expect um, for the, the upcoming course? Like what is, if you want to lay it out, like what's the, what does the course entail? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so it's eight weeks and it opens on, so registration op is open right now. Um, the course starts October 12th and I have it set up so that each week is a different theme. And so that all of those themes build on one another and kind of dovetail. Mm -hmm. So we start off with like, why are we here? What's the backdrop? Like, how do we learn effectively? How do we think out of the box? And what are some of the like ways to learn better? how to find and maintain a really nice knife. And then we dive into the ancestral and bushcraft skills. So week two is basics of ancestral skills and bushcraft. And, you know, all of these themes are huge scopes. So I'm picking a couple things within each theme to focus on. I can't do the gamut of ancestral sure, sure, sure. skills in a few classes in one week. So each gathering, and this is the second one, will have similar themes, but different topics on that theme. So the second or the third week is plants and knowing how to identify plants, understanding plant biology and kind of the overarching things that you can apply to all plants wherever you are, as opposed to like, this is this and that is that. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth week is wild foods and wild harvest. 
so medicine and food and and fiber um and then the fifth is more animals and animal processing and preserving food um like preserving preserving meat specifically um and then we do hide tanning and then handcrafts and then kind of bringing it all together and bigger picture and jumping off places so it's this kind of it's you know all of these themes that that come together and and build on one another so every gathering is unique in the classes but they're all based on giving you this broad background in a bunch of different skills and eventually i'll also have master's courses which are deep dives into one particular skill like we could easily do eight weeks on hide tanning but the gatherings are are about these different themes and the broader picture. And they're also about the fact that we're doing it together. So we have weekly Zoom calls. We have an online forum where students are interacting with me and with one another. We have you know, like themed pages on the different things so people can bring content, you know, from their lives that isn't even necessarily the things we're covering in the classes and discuss it together. And, um, and then they can have that, you know, they can be part of that community ongoing even when the gathering isn't there. Because that's what happened the first time I offered this is I realized now I've got all of these people so excited, so enthused about this stuff and feeling what it is to have community and support in it. And now what, I'm just like dropping them off and saying good luck. Like, right. no, I care about these people over, over months of working together. So now I'm working on the Buckskin Revolution Academy, which is an ongoing platform you can be a member of. You have access to classes, you have access to the online forums, we have regular you know, face-to-face -face Zoom calls where we can talk about all of these subjects plus things outside of the subjects. So I'm super excited and, you know, it feels revolutionary and my business is Buckskin Revolution. And just, it's been so clear that while teaching in person and in the wild is more my preference right now, what the world is asking for is a way to get these skills to more people who don't have the access necessarily to come in person to wild spaces, but still need these skills so bad. So that's the whole idea. So um, I love to uh, to finish all of my podcasts with kind of just like a little a little little version of the Proust questionnaire. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Proust questionnaire. It's 35 questions to really get to know about. It's not going to be 35 questions. Don't worry. It's not a, it's not a test. I just cherry picked a few and added one of my own um, just to kind of kick it off. So I'm just going to throw these at you and answer however you want. What's something you learned about yourself during the quarantine? Ah, uh, whoo. I guess um, during the quarantine, I would say what I learned was the degree to which I have a community spirit and like my drive to be of service. Like as soon as things started to get rough, I was like, what do people need? How do I get the things Amazing. to the people who need them right now? Cause like, I feel fine. I feel like I've got this, but I see everyone around me freaking out. How do I, how do I be of service? You're one of those amazing people who like, there's two types of people. There's people that run towards the fire and people that run from the fire. And you were, you obviously want to get in there and help people, which I, I love more than anything. Which historical figure do you most identify with? Huh? Well, I will say that I feel like we don't have access to a lot of information about historical figures that aren't men. Um, <laughs> I, and I don't know that much about a lot of historical figures that are women because but I would like, I don't know, like Amelia Earhart or something like a woman who's like, I'm doing this thing that's really bold and adventurous, even though they tell me I'm supposed to be home washing dishes. But no, that's not what's happening. Well, uh, I, that, could, that makes <laughs> sense for me because you're saying, you know what? Fuck this. This is for men to fly planes. No, this is for nature is for men. No, I'm going to go and show you what I can do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, Great question. Uh, I can be really, I'm one of those like creative chaotic types who just like makes things in a flurry but can never find my keys. <laughs> so I think like I, that I could be more effective in a lot of the things that I do if I was a little bit better organized and a little less like artistic, you know, Einstein-y brain just like all over the place with the wild hair and the, you know, knows the theory of rel relativity but can't like find his shoes when he has to go outside don't ever change <laughs> which is not to say that i'm like Einstein. what's that so don't ever change that's a, that's the best quality but me i'm the same way i'm, I'm very like i'm add ocd there's sometimes i don't know i never know where my keys my phone or my wallet are and right. and, and, and just, that's just always been a problem for me so i don't ever change the creativity is way more important than being able to find your damn keys <laughs> yeah i wouldn't trade them but it'd be sweet to be able to have both at the same time you know <laughs> What is your greatest fear? 
Mm, uh, that's a great question. There's lots of that. You know, I mean, I think that as an only child, like as a single woman and an only child um, of a single mother that like not like my mom, losing my mom, who's, you know, the, the closest thing to me, but like losing, losing my family and losing loved ones and not having a sense of home and family and community, which is interesting, right? Because we already talked about how I did really good alone. And that's really true. Um, I'm very independent, but I really, really value people and human relationships. And um, like, I don't, I don't love thinking about what it'll be um, in my world as again, like an only child of a single mother when she's not around. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> sentiment for me, family, family is everything. My, my son just turned two years old, so I couldn't imagine not having him or being with being there for him in this world. Yeah. Um, what is your most treasured possession? Possession well, It's interesting because I'm not a very possession oriented person. And I like, there are so many things that are important to me. And a lot of them are things that I've made or things that represent certain experiences. And I've lost a lot of my most treasured possessions and been like, Oh, okay. I guess it's time to give energy towards some other type of thing possession. So, um, yeah, so I would, I would lead with possessions don't tend to be primary <laughs> for me. Um, my most treasured position. Okay, let's see. Where's my? This is probably my most treasured possession. Um, this is a knife that one of my dear, dear friends made for me. Amazing. He made this from iron that he made himself by collecting sand in a desert wash with a magnet and the sand that had enough iron in it stuck to the magnet. And then he melted that down and got the extra bits out of it and smelted raw iron and made me this freaking knife that's pretty badass spoken yeah spoken to someone who i love knives i'm all about knives obviously as a chef my knife is is the most you know right. the, the probably the most important thing in my arsenal so to see i've never smelted my own knife <laughs> <I've> never, <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is quite the possession and did you make the case that, it, that it's in right now the sheath no he made that he made that too he asked me if i wanted to make my own and i was like no because this is like this is so you like he, he like measured my hand and made the handle specifically fit my hand and made, made the blade to my shape specifications. But I asked him to do the sheath too, just so it was more, more him, but that's probably leather that he tanned too. I mean, he does hide tanning as well. So that's yeah. an incredible, incredible gift. Um, it is. Yeah. What is your motto? Oh, wow. Well, my motto, I mean the, like the, motto I used on my business is inspire, empower, connect, because those, those are kind of the three things with, with what I teach, like empower people with the skills. So they feel like they have more options and they feel capable and inspire them on, you know, feeling full of hope and like why this matters and then connect, like feeling, feeling connected to the wilder world outside, to the wild inside ourselves, to our human community. So that, I would say that's my motto, those three things. And look, inspire, empower, connect. That's, that's my, my backdrop I hung with my surgical tools. <laughs> I, I love that. I think it's a perfect place to end. I mean, you've obviously inspired me and empowered me to, to maybe get off my ass and get out into nature a little bit more. And I, and, and I have to thank you for connecting with me today and being so generous with your time. And I know that you are literally out in, you know, in, in the wilds doing your thing all the time. And uh, where else can we find you? What other what other socials can we find you on? Yeah, great question. So um, so I have a website, www.buckskinrevolution.com, and you can find kind of all my other things through that. Um, eventually, you'll be able to find me at Buckskin Revolution Academy as well, which is my online teaching. Um, I'm on Instagram at Buckskin Revolution. I'm on Facebook, also Buckskin Revolution. YouTube, guess, Buckskin Revolution. Right. So all of those. And then I also have a Patreon membership, oh, um, which has been how, you know, I'm, I don't really make money on YouTube. I don't have a big enough followership and I'm not putting out, I'm not cranking out the videos at that rate. So, so what's really funding my YouTube videos are my Patreon members. So that's like my, my team, the Buckskin Revolution team are the Patreon members. And you can join for like the lowest tier is $3 a month. Um, and we, I've just changed so that now we're doing regular Zoom calls with the team. So we actually like get to meet one another and interact face to face. So that's huge. Folks who really are excited and inspired with what I'm doing and want to be involved, I, I point them towards the Patreon or the gatherings because that's all about 
community and learning and doing it together and feeling supported in that. Amazing. Juania Thibault, thank you so much. And I need to get my ass up there and, uh, and, and learn some of these ancestral skills so I'll be a little more useful in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> great. Bye.